As noted in the previous lesson, DNA is the gold standard when it comes to providing scientific evidence to a court to either prove someone is guilty of the crime to which they are charged or to exonerate the innocent. When 15-year-old Don Ashworth was raped and murdered in Leicestershire, England in 1986, Alec Jeffries was a genetics professor at the nearby university. A few years earlier, he discovered that patterns in some regions of a person's DNA could be used to distinguish one individual from another. So far, Jeffries had put his DNA pattern recognition technique to work in paternity and immigration cases, but now the police wanted him to help solve Ashworth's murder, as well as a similar one that happened in 1983. In an attempt to find the culprit, the one whose DNA had been left behind, the police undertook a genetic dragnet. They obtained blood and saliva samples from more than 4,000 men in the Leicestershire area between the ages of 17 and 34, and had Jeffries analyze the DNA. They didn't find a match, but a man was overheard saying he'd been paid to pose as someone else and provide false samples. The person trying to evade the DNA dragnet was Colin Pitchfork. When Pitchfork's DNA was analyzed, it matched the crime scene samples and he was arrested in September of 1987 and convicted and sentenced to life in prison the following January. Timothy Wilson Spencer, also known as the Southside Strangler, was a serial killer who committed three rapes and murders in Virginia in the fall of 1987. In addition, he is believed to have committed at least one previous murder in 1984 for which a different man, David Vasquez, was wrongly convicted. Spencer became the first serial killer in the United States to be convicted on the basis of DNA evidence, with David Vasquez being the first to be exonerated following conviction on the basis of exculpatory DNA. Today, investigators can retrieve DNA profiles from skin cells left behind when a criminal merely touches the surface. This improved sensitivity combined with new data analysis has made it possible for investigators to identify and distinguish multiple individuals from the DNA in a mixed sample. In the early days, a DNA case didn't get worked unless there was a suspect and a blood sample from that suspect. In such cases, the payoff was obvious. The DNA could be used to include or exclude that person. Without a suspect, the benefit of analyzing crime scene samples wasn't so obvious. They yielded little information without a suspect's sample for comparison. What is DNA fingerprinting or DNA profiling? Leicester University geneticist Alec Jeffries developed a technique called DNA fingerprinting in 1985. It allows DNA samples from different people to be compared to look for similarities and differences. It's used for solving crimes and can also confirm if people are related to each other, like in paternity testing. Any two people in the world have 99.9% .9 of their DNA the same. So this process analyzes the differences in the remaining 0.1%. This modern technology is called DNA profiling. It's a very sensitive technique which only needs a few skin cells, a hair root, or a tiny amount of blood or saliva. There are sections, or loci, of chromosomes, where instead of a gene consisting of a long sequence of bases, there are much shorter sequences of three, four, or five bases that are repeated many times. For example, these repeated sequences are called short tandem repeats, or STR. At these places on the chromosomes where we find these STRs, there are areas that vary in number of repeats. DNA profiling only looks at these STRs. A cell sample is collected. This could be from some blood at a crime scene or a swab from the inside of someone's cheek, for example. The DNA is then extracted from the sample. Many copies of this DNA may be made using the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. Special enzymes called restriction endonucleases are used to cut the DNA up into different size pieces. 
The DNA samples are then put into wells in a special gel called agarose for the process of gel electrophoresis, which separates the DNA fragments by size. The pattern is then transferred to a nylon sheet in southern blotting. And finally, the lines produced by the DNA samples from different people are compared. So let's have a go at using DNA profiles to solve some mysteries. An item was stolen in a burglary. A drop of blood was left behind by the thief. Samples of DNA were taken from four suspects and compared to the sample left at the crime scene. Which suspect is guilty? Here's a clue. Look for the one that is most similar to the one from the crime scene. Pause the video while you decide. Suspect 3 is guilty. Can you see how the pattern of bands matches in Suspect 3 and the crime scene? Their DNA is the same. Let's try another. A soldier has been killed in an explosion and has lost his dog tags that identify him. Three soldiers are missing from their unit, so the army asks the three sets of parents for a DNA sample so that they might compare it to the soldier's DNA and therefore make an identification. Remember, the soldier will only share half of his DNA with each parent. So which set of parents is the soldier the son of? Pause the video while you decide. Parent C and D. As you can see, he inherited the first band from parent D and the second, third and fourth from parent C and so on. So now you understand how DNA profiles or fingerprints are made and seen some examples of where they can be used. You can even interpret a DNA profile. Please like and share our After governments started maintaining databases of DNA profiles, the incentive for running unknown samples skyrocketed. Violent crimes such as sexual assault and homicide have a high degree of repeat offenders. So once databases were established, if you ran a case where there was no suspect and you queried the database, you may well be able to identify that suspect. Even if an unknown sample didn't match an offender sample from the database, it might match DNA from other unsolved crimes. Joseph James D'Angelo appeared for the first time as a defendant in a California courtroom today. The scenes were unspeakably violent, so DNA was left behind. But as Kim Brunhuber explains, the match investigators were looking for had to wait for a more modern database to emerge. Cracking a case that had gone cold for more than 40 years was always going to take something new, something special. Over the last decade or so, millions of Canadians and Americans have mailed in samples of their saliva to companies which analyze their DNA and help them trace their family tree. Few users ever suspected their spittle could be used to find criminals. This was an amazing retirement gift for me. I was able to search that profile against the other public profiles that individuals have placed in there and produce literally a, a simple table that indicates how much DNA that person shares with the profile that I uploaded and then gives the username and the email address of the person that is uh, matching. I believe very strongly that it's the greatest tool ever given to law enforcement. But for American users of these DNA kits, the thought of police sifting through their genes is potentially discomforting. Most sites don't divulge customers' data to police unless they have a court order, but they admit there is no guarantee of privacy. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. So to be clear, as Kim said, the website where police found the match is open source. So that means that people had voluntarily and publicly shared their DNA profiles. That isn't the case with kit testing companies like 23andMe. Now, GEDmatch says it had no idea police were using its open source website this way. In a statement, the company says, while the database was created for genealogical research, it's important that GED match participants understand the possible uses of their DNA, including identification of relatives who have committed crimes or were victims of crimes. It went on to say, if you're worried about the use of your information, don't upload it or delete your account. Joseph. 
The drawback in the criminal justice system with DNA analysis is the availability of testing. While almost all jurisdictions in the common and civil law world are moving to make DNA testing available to convicted individuals who want to prove their innocence, there are difficulties with access for that purpose. Many jurisdictions put limitations in place which include no access to DNA if the defendant originally pleaded guilty to the crime, thereby, thereby taking false confessions out of the picture. Not every jurisdiction has significant or even adequate safeguards to preserve DNA evidence. There is often no appeal to a decision denying access. And for those who are no longer incarcerated, but still want to clear their names, DNA analysis is not available. Such roadblocks need to be removed so that this gold standard can do the work it was intended to do and provide relief to the wrongly convicted. Our next video lesson will be on compensation.